This meeting is being recorded. Hey everybody, Cameron here. Um, I'm excited to be back with EA Zoom meetings. It's been a while. Like we were talking about just a second ago, it's been like two years or maybe over two years. So I'm excited to be back and to share some things that I've found um, practicing evolutionary astrology, but also infusing some other um, ideologies from other branches or let's say systems of astrology. So today I'm going to be talking about synthesizing techniques and some of the things aren't really even techniques, so to speak. We might get to a technique today and some reflections that I have on the technique that I've been like looking at and from a traditional astrology perspective and then infusing evolutionary astrology concepts to it. And I've had like great results with it. And so it's more of a I'm continuing to explore and inviting people into the exploration as well. So just a little bit about me for people who don't know me or are not familiar with my work. Um, I always put these two degrees first because I always forget about them. So I have to put them up there to give myself some clout or seem like I know what I'm talking about. <laughs> um, I also have over 300 hours in like hands-on internship with like physical therapy. Um, when I was in college, I started studying some alchemy and that was like more from the perspective of Carl Jung, but also from the Western alchemical tradition. Uh, I studied at the School of Evolutionary Herbalism. And from there, I was learning medical astrology with my teacher, Sage Popham. But I first started with evolutionary astrology because I was seeking out information about astrology and I worked at a spiritual supply store and I would ask everybody like, what do you know about astrology? What do you know about astrology? And nobody would know. So one day the person I'm working, I was working with she told me, why don't you learn astrology? Because nobody else seems to know anything about it. So I was like, OK, cool. And then I soon after came across some of Jeffrey Wolf Green's work and I was blown away and I like physically could feel um, a lot of the truth that was in the practice of evolutionary astrology. But soon thereafter, um, well, not even soon thereafter, like maybe after like three to five years, I started learning more things in astrology. And so I started learning quote unquote traditional astrology and I put the quote unquote because there is no one coherent lineage um, in astrology, to be quite honest. If you go back and look at the history, which I'm not going to talk about history, I don't really too much jive with history. I don't really care about it. And I also think that people who think they know the history of astrology are mistaking themselves a lot of times because the tradition, quote unquote tradition, it, it comes from so many different areas and it's a cohesive merger of many things rather than one thing. So to say traditional astrology just is kind of misleading sometimes. And I also practice root work and I learned a lot about root work uh, working in the spiritual supply store that I worked in here in Memphis, Tennessee and learned from like a lot of wise women who like came from lineages who practiced for like oh, yeah, a few generations. Right now, I'm currently in Ayurveda school. Uh, I learned a lot about Taoist herbalism. I'm an herbalist as well. I mean, obviously, with the School of Evolutionary Herbalism, I was learning there. Um, but I've been practicing herbalism since day one of even learning about it um, from the perspective of just asking people, what does this herb do? What does that herb do? Learning one herb and then um, inviting people to use it if they had a, a similar resonance or condition that like went along with it. And so having direct experience with astrology and with herbalism accelerated my process greatly. With Dallas herbalism, I started working with that just to go from a space of working with people who were experiencing ailments to people who were uh, athletes and people who felt OK and they were already good at baseline and being able to like help them take their health to what they call health beyond danger. And then also people who like work with like yoga or Taoism and stuff like that, they want to take themselves from feeling okay, vital and healthy to feeling more compassion, to being able to feel God or the Tao or spirit more. And so I learned Tao, a, a, a lot of concepts in Taoist herbalism and worked with a lot of Taoist herbs in order to further that progress in my practice. And then I also have taken a 200 hour Kundalini yoga training um, even though I'm not teaching right now, uh, maybe I will be soon. So, But I do teach some of the ideas and practices in my own astrological practice as well. 
So what's on the menu for today? So today I'm going to talk, like I was saying before, how I'm not going to lecture over history. Um, but also it's important for us to remember and honor the lineages and uh, that we come from, right? And so just like respecting the Mesopotamian Babylonian astrologers, respecting the Egyptian astrologers, re respecting the Hellenistic astrologers, respecting the medieval astrologers, the Islamic astrologers, um, the Renaissance astrologers, all these people that came before us, right? We have our ancestors that move through our blood, but we also have ancestors that come through lineages of practices that we adapt inherent or inherent or we um, learn from our teachers. And so just taking a moment to like honor Jeffrey Wolf Green for all the work that he did as well to put together such a beautiful body of work that has like helped me so much in my life. And it's helped me so much even with my practice of astrology outside of evolutionary astrology. Um, so yeah, just want to take a moment to honor that and then also honor being autonomous. And so part of being autonomous is for me, um, because sometimes I kind of have like a heretical kind of nature to me. I don't stay within one lineage um, with almost anything, right? Um, and so it, there is a time where it's going to come where I'm starting to go deeper into a specific lineage. And whenever I talk about things, I, I do my best to honor the lineage that it comes from. But all these things that I've learned, I have found these commonalities between all the things. And so I still have to present it in the way that feels good and true for me. So today we'll talk about we'll talk about what I've inserted into my evolutionary astrology perspective. And we'll talk about some traditional and medical techniques or ideas or concepts um, from the evolutionary astrology perspective. And so these are some of the things that I've inserted into my evolutionary astrology practice. This list is very small, to be quite honest, because nothing here says anything about exercises. Really, Well, I guess I'll talk a little bit about that. Um, and I will talk a little bit about my like herbal work and then also just my understanding of anatomy and physiology and things like that. But what we'll talk about today is the co-rulerships of Scorpio, Aquarius, and Pisces. Uh, we'll talk about evolutionary astrology from a psychosomatic lens. We'll talk about evolutionary astrology and how this can correspond to creating what I call a zodiacal medicine cabinet. We'll talk about the doctrine of sect that comes from traditional astrology. And from my current understanding, it starts with Hellenistic astrology, where the idea of sect originates from. We'll talk about triplicity lords. We'll talk about aspect theory additions. And so when I say aspect theory additions, it'll be just things that I have added on top of or in combination with some of the evolutionary astrology's perspectives about aspects and what they mean. And then if we have time, I'll go into talking about the turning of the year, which it's more popularly, popular, popularly called uh, annual perfections currently. So co-rulership. In evolutionary astrology, we don't really use co-rulership but um, there's three signs specifically that work with the outer planets as rulerships. Well, in traditional astrology, this was before we even discovered the outer planets. So before Pluto ruled Scorpio, Mars did. And so something that I've been finding with my evolutionary astrology practice is that has been very helpful, especially since I don't I'm not always in a spiritual supply store and getting clients that way and working with people in that fashion. So when I was working in the spiritual supply store uh, regularly to give the signification or the rulership of Pluto to Scorpio always landed. It like absolutely always landed. And I had a theory after I started learning traditional astrology for a while that the theory was that all these people coming into the spiritual supply store, they had the desire to go deeper than just things that we could see. They had a desire to go into the unconscious world and, and try to be able to experience and explain things that were beyond the physical eyes, beyond the senses. And so that's why Pluto corresponded with them. Like, that's why the correspondence of Scorpio um, resonated so much with people from that angle, 
But as my practice went on further, oftentimes I would talk to people and I would say things about Pluto and the rulership of the Scorpio and what house it ruled. And sometimes it just didn't land for people. And I thought that was really interesting. So what I started doing was just reading every all the like reading Scorpio, the rulership of Mars first, and then taking it deeper and then speaking about Pluto underneath the surface. So I've kind of learned this way of not introducing Pluto first all the time, depending on what type of reading it is, what type of person I'm talking to, depending on what at what question they're asking me about. Right. And then also sometimes I find in my practice personally that Pluto isn't necessary to read the sign of Scorpio. Because if somebody's asking me a very mundane or practical question, you know, an outer planet having to do with a generation or intergenerational trauma or having to do with um, unconscious processes, it's not even really needed, right? So Pluto, I mean, so Mars, from the perspective of evolutionary astrology has to do with um, our instinctual action, our moment to moment waking life. It has to do with our instincts and our conscious desires. And when I say conscious, I don't mean, oh, wow, I'm really aware of what I'm doing right now. I'm speaking conscious on like a gut level, a gut response level. Something's happening. What's that over there in the dark, right? It's that kind of conscious desire. And so we can find a way to more easily be aware of those things. But underneath the surface, Pluto creeps. And what's happening with Pluto underneath the surface oftentimes has to do with unconscious desires. So what's the deeper, deeper desire behind the reason why you're instinctually acting? It's coming from somewhere, especially if the situation that we're talking about or the circumstance that we're in doesn't have to do with a life or death situation, right? Why am I asserting myself towards being an astrologer? Why is someone asserting themselves in a certain way in a relationship when they're jealous or when they're going after something they desire? Underneath the surface, there's this deep attachment. There's a deep emotional and psychological attachment that at times can even express itself in the way of I'm doing these things and my conscious desires, maybe even not aware of what I'm doing in a trial and error way, because there's something underneath the surface that's pulling me in that direction. So Pluto's was pulling from underneath, deep within, and Mars is about how we're expressing that and how it's showing up. It's as if the deeper desire, which is Pluto, doesn't even always show up in the physical appearance of what's happening. But we have to have special tools or special sight to be able to see what's really happening below the surface. The next outer planet that gives that's, that has rulership in evolutionary astrology that doesn't in traditional astrology is the planet Uranus corresponded to Aquarius. In, in traditional astrology, it's Saturn that's corresponding to Aquarius. And so with this one, I oftentimes see that Saturn represents boundaries, right? And so since Saturn represents boundaries, inherently, if we have a boundary, that inherently makes two things, an inside and an outside. And oftentimes when people speak of Aquarius, especially from a modern astrology perspective or an evolutionary astrology perspective, we're talking about taking a step away from what is the social norm? What is the conditioning patterns that we've been in, right? When we think of Saturn, if we have a boundary in our consciousness, that means everything on the inside is the layers of conditioning that we've taken on and are aware of. If we take a step outside of that, Saturn still represents that boundary, but beyond that boundary, we have Uranus, which helps us to individuate, which helps us to have these moments of flashes of genius. And what do we do with those flashes of genius? We bring it back into the structure of our consciousness. We bring it back in our day-to-day -day life in the work that we do, Saturn, and we implement it because we all have a responsibility to do things on this earth and to do things with people out in the world. And so Uranus gives us those flashes of lightning to be able to know what to do, but Saturn is the thing that allows us to go do the work actually. Also something here that I find is like really interesting um, with my practice of medical astrology 
is that Saturn represents balance the actual physical body in the bones and the tendons and the ligaments, the musculoskeletal system as a whole. And so that's a structure, right? Also it rules the skin, which is a boundary. Well, outside of that, and so that's more from the perspective of Saturn's rulership in relationship to Capricorn. Well, Saturn's rulership in relationship to Aquarius also still has to do with boundaries it still has to do with structures, but it just so happens that it's more of an electric informational boundary, an electric informational structure, which I correspond to what we would call the aura field or just the energy that's like radiating off of somebody, the nervous system energy, the specific energetic signature that someone has that's right outside of their skin. In that information, we can't see it or we can't often see it because there are some people who can see people's auras or feel the energy around people. And it's like, you can get closer and closer to somebody. And even if you do this practice, if you just keep stepping closer and closer to somebody sooner or later, as, as a, if depending on how tuned you are, you'll start to feel their field. Right. And that field is electrical information and it is a boundary. Right. It's a point of connection between you stepping into this person's energy field, their informational um, field, and what uh, I got from Mark Jones, which is called the morphogenetic field, right? So, and, and then also just like the nervous system, it doesn't, it lives in the body for sure, but we can feel it outside of the body. And then also when we think about like disassociating, it's like we can't handle the structure of this reality and the things that are going on. We feel to press down on by the reality. So we hop out of it, right? We remove ourselves from that boundary of the feeling of oppression, repression, depression, and tension. And then we have Pisces. And the co-rulership between with Pisces is from the traditional astrology perspective, we have the planet Jupiter. And from the evolutionary astrology and the modern astrology perspective, we have Neptune. And so it's really interesting because both of these planets have a tendency to enlarge in themselves or to give or to be big, right? And also kind of at times they both have this quality of boundlessness. So Jupiter expands out and grows and grows and grows. And then also Neptune is like, it not only does it grow, but it is like the whole thing itself, right? Which is like a very expansive feeling. So just thinking about this also from the perspective of, <clears throat> Pisces and how oftentimes there's this strong creative nature to them, right? Or to that sign but to the people who, who bear that sign strongly as well. And so even if we look at the, the glyph of Jupiter, it has the crescent of soul and it has the cross of matter. And if you embody yourself as Jupiter, you'll see looking out that the crescent of soul is on the right side in the right brain. So it's as if the right brain is receptive to something and then you incarnate it, right? And Neptune is like the thing that is outside of you receiving that and incarnating it. Neptune is the whole thing itself. It's to create a flow of energy that pervades the whole universe itself. Some people even postulate that Neptune will correspond directly to God or one's relationship to God. So from a psychosomatic lens, from the perspective of evolutionary astrology, we could think of this from the perspective of let's talk about hmm, let's talk about Aries. From a psychosomatic lens, Aries is ruled by Mars. So this also has this quality of this instinctual primal nature. And when we think about an instinct instinctual primal nature, a lot of times the things that happen is that we have our brain stem activated, right? Like the oldest part of us, the lizard brain that we have, it's a fight or flight kind of energy, right? And so thinking about the things that we attribute to Aries, 
And what happens when we have an excessive amount of Aries energy activated or alive for us? Yes, we're trying to go in new directions. Yes, we're trying to be pioneers. But underneath that, on a very primal, basic level, we're just in the present moment, surviving, moving head first. And what does that do to a person to be in that state of being in, in an excessive manner? Well, it would cause an issue potentially with the adrenal glands, which Aries also corresponds to, right? So we have Aries, we have this nature of instinctual primal awareness. And if we stay in that state of instinctual primal awareness too much because of the heightened sense of fight or flight um, experience in the present moment, then that will affect the adrenal glands. So just seeing how all those things coalesce and come together so smoothly. Another sign that I'll talk about for a moment is hmm, hmm, Capricorn. Let's talk about Capricorn for a second. So from a psychosomatic lens, when we're talking about Capricorn, we know that Capricorn is an earth sign. It's a yin sign, so it's down and in. And it's also ruled by Saturn, right? It's also cardinal, but it's also ruled by Saturn. And so a lot of times when people talk about Capricorn in the current space and time that we're in, they talk about climbing to the top of the ladder or somebody being a CEO. Now, this isn't necessarily what Capricorn is really about, but that's how it shows up in our current space and times very often. But one thing that we can say that is true about Capricorn that they are taking responsibility for something in the world, right? And they're doing it in a practical way. And sometimes when we do that, we feel the pressure, right? We feel the social norms, we feel the conditioning field in the ways that we should be. And so when we feel those things and we're not expressing them, oftentimes they sinks deep into our bones and affects our attitude. And if something's affecting our attitude, right, because our conditioning definitely affects our attitude, I always think of it as a, like thinking about the inner and outer, outer attitude. So the inner attitude is I feel sad right now. And so when I feel sad, I'll hunch my shoulders forward and I'll close off my heart to protect myself. And that's my outer attitude, right? Internally, I feel sad and I feel like I'm not being cared for. And externally, my outer attitude will show that. My musculoskeletal system will literally adjust itself in order to express what's happening internally. So just thinking about that with your evolutionary astrology practice and like, how does this sign influence us on a physiological level? What does this do when I'm expressing Aries in a strong, powerful way, right? What happens when... I'm expressing Capricorn in a strong and powerful way. Maybe I'll be regimented. Maybe I'll make sure all the structures of my body and my posture and my attitude are coherent and in the way that reality is actually structured, right? So just feeling into that and thinking about that. Also, I forgot to say in the beginning, but if anybody hops on to the Zoom call while we're here live and you have a question, I have an open invitation policy. So open invitation to literally cut me off wherever I'm speaking and ask the question if that's desired. So zodiacal medicine, what is this all about? In, in the beginning, I talked about, I said something about a zodiacal medicine cabinet. And so I wanna talk a little bit about Scorpio and how we can start to form a zodiacal medicine cabinet. And maybe I'll give like, a little practice to show everyone just like an example of what I mean here. So when it comes to Scorpio, oftentimes we're talking about things that are like we have, it's a fixed water sign and it's co-ruled by Mars and Pluto. Right. And so when I think of fixed water, oftentimes I think about emotions that have, have, have been deep inside of us. Right. And those things are what are motivating our behaviors the deep emotions that we have. And so the correspondence here with Scorpio is about the colon. And so with our fixed water, with our fixed emotions, the question is how much Mars have we been bringing in to be able to put fire to that, to transform it? And how much Pluto underneath the surface, how much deep psychological unconscious work have we done 
to be able to transmute this process, to be able to rid ourselves of the things that aren't truly serving us. And when we're talking about the correspondence of Scorpio to the colon, the colon is doing that very thing, is trying to get rid of the things that we no longer need. So we eat food and then we process it. We try to transform it as much as possible. And then we want to get rid of it. And so that's how the colon corresponds to Scorpio. And so when it comes to this, one plant that I think about, one of my teachers taught me about is the plant called Oregon grape root. And Oregon grape root is a great plant to put into your zodiacal medicine cabinet. Because even sometimes when you look at the root, it actually has the similar like structure or shape as a scorpion, right? Which is a really interesting thing to think about and feel into. In herbalism, we call it doctrine of signatures. And so, and also the psychological complex that specifically corresponds with Oregon grape root is to have a deep fear of something, even when it's kind of I'm not going to say unnecessary, but it's not warranted, let's say, right? It's like having this deep fear and this paranoia of something happening. It was, oh, no, I fear death from this experience or I'm experiencing things as if I might die if it happens. And so that's a very strong Pluto type of energy. And it just so happens that this plant works on the colon. It works on the liver and other stuff, too, but it works on the colon and it has to do with fear, these deep fears that can create paranoia within us. And so just feeling into that, thinking about that, not just from the perspective of herbs, but my question would be, what is the medicine that you carry? Are you a dancer? Are you an aromatherapist? Because if you are, you can think about this orientation or frame of mind and project it onto the zodiac signs and begin to create your own zodiacal medicine cabinet. There's a practice that we do in Kundalini Yoga. It's actually a part of a practice that we do in Kundalini Yoga. And there's one specific posture that I've used for people who have like strong Scorpio placements or having a highlighted experience with Scorpio, so to speak. And I'm going to stop to share. I'm going to stop sharing for just a moment. And I'm just going to run through this practice with everyone. Um, Let's see here. And this practice specifically uh, works on the colon. And so I'm going to show you the practice. And then after I show you the practice, I'm just going to invite everyone to do the practice with me for, let's say, two minutes. And also at the beginning of this lecture, I didn't put my like disclaimer up, but talk to your primary health care physician. I'm not a doctor. I'm not a primary health care physician. So also in saying that as a disclaimer, Whenever you're listening to someone speak, whether I'm talking about Oregon grape root and it sounds sexy or good to you, this practice that I'm about to show you, have discernment in what you're doing. Don't just listen to somebody and say, oh, that sounds nice, and just hop into it. Do your research, go to your primary health care physician, go to your Ayurvedic doctor, go to your herbalist, go to your personal trainer, go to your physical therapist, and um, ask them what um, feels good for you. But, you know, at the end of the day, have discernment and do the thing if it feels true to you. So this practice is very, very simple. So all we're doing in this practice, and I'll show two variations of it, or I'll give a modification. So in this practice, all we're doing is having our legs out. You can kind of have them close to shoulder width apart, but I tend to like to go a little further. And then we take our hands up into the air. And then all we do here is we take our hands down to the ankle and then back up. And then down to the ankle on the other side and then back up. If you happen to be doing this and you just tried to do that and it felt uncomfortable in any region of your body, specifically your your lower back, you can also do a practice where you take your hands and you don't put them up in the air but you simply slide them down your leg to the point that feels comfortable for you. This should feel, you should feel no pain in this practice. So you can slide your your hands down your leg to the ankle bone and then slide your hands back up and then slide your hand down to the other ankle bone 
and then slide your hand back up. And while I do this practice, when I'm speaking with people and working with people who have this highlighted Scorpio nature, the thing that I do is I invite them to think about all the things that they haven't digested and processed and let go of. Because if we're thinking about that, while we're also pressing on the colon and helping the colon move, we're doing things double time, right? So we can go sit and talk to a therapist to try to get rid of things, and that's helpful. We can also go to go exercise or go take laxatives um, in a healthy way and, and do all these things to remove issues and blockages physiologically. But what happens when we start to infuse all those things together? We have a more holistic perspective on what we need to do for our healing process. So I'm gonna set the timer for two minutes and just invite everybody to join in with me. <clears throat> And I like to breathe in on the way up, breathe out on the way down. In, out. In, out. And just being mindful to go at your own pace. Don't feel like you have to stay stagnant or stuck. I'm kind of moving in a very mechanical way right now but there have been times when I start to play a little bit like lean over to the side and then come down if you feel comfortable doing that then have at it but just letting you know to have organic movement For anybody following along, just so you know, I'm about to pick up the pace just a little bit. This is not a demand from me for you to pick up the pace, but if you feel comfortable, then you begin, you can begin to pick the pace up. Have a seat. And then just take a moment. Feel into your colon. Even just the idea of feeling into it is good enough. Maybe also feeling into your pelvic floor. See if there's built up tension there where you're gripping because this is another correspondence of Scorpio, the pelvic floor. There's a saying in evolutionary astrology that what you resist, you persist. And so the pelvic floor is a great place to explore with this idea in mind. How are you clenching and holding on to things in your day-to-day -day life? How can you look towards where Scorpio is at in your chart, where Mars is at in your chart, where Pluto is at in your chart, and applying it back to this principle for greater awareness for yourself, for sharing with others in your own astrological practice, if it feels true, And just taking three more long, slow breaths before you come back to enter the room.
Hmm. Thanks everybody for taking that moment with me. I hope you got some benefit out of that. Okay, let's see here. I needed that more than I thought. It always happens. <clears throat> okay, cool. So that's the general idea and concept of zodiacal medicine. Just thinking about what medicine, medicinal tools you have. It could be cooking. It could be, um, like I said before, aromatherapy. It could be energy work. You could be an herbalist. You could be a doctor. You could be a massage therapist. And just being able to apply the evolutionary astrology model specifically to the idea of the somatic, the psychosomatic lens, and then being able to um, invite people into having remedies for these things. Because it's nice and beautiful to tell somebody what's going on with their psychology and to have a breakthrough, but it's even better to like have a remedy for it, right? Not saying that this should be an expectation of everyone. This is my personal practice and my personal perspective. So it's just my invitation to bring you into that. So next we'll talk about the doctrine of sect. So something in traditional astrology that is highlighted and is not present in the evolutionary astrology paradigm is the doctrine of sect. And so all this is, is essentially, if you have the sun above the horizon, you have what's called a day chart. And if you have the sun below the horizon, you have what's called a night chart. And so even just thinking about astrology as it is in the mainstream right now, when someone asks you what's your sign, everyone goes to say, I'm an Aquarius, right? Because for me, I'm an, I have an Aquarius sun. However, my Aquarius sun is below the horizon. And since my Aquarius sun is below the horizon, I have what's called a night chart. And so we have the luminaries, the sun and the moon, and these are the things that will, quote unquote, be your sign. So whenever you have the sun below the horizon and you have a night chart, the moon is the main luminary. So if for everybody out there, if you have the sun below the horizon, when someone says, what's your zodiac sign? You can say what your sun sign is, but you can also say, but I was born at night, so my moon sign is fill in the blank. Right. And so this gives nuance and meaning that oftentimes is overlooked strongly in a lot of different um, from a lot of different perspectives in astrology. Hmm, I want to say something else. Hmm. Yeah, I was going to say uh, people who don't identify with their sun sign, oftentimes they are night charts. So that's one thing too to consider when somebody's like, but I don't really feel like an Aquarius, though. Right. I feel like a Gemini. Right. For me, because I have a Gemini moon and I'm have a night chart, then that would mean that the moon is my main luminary. So there's just something to give, give another differentiation between things um, and how to infuse this into your evolutionary astrology practice. I would say go deeper and look into it, um, but I'll talk a little bit about how I see it. Um, so even just from the concept of day and night, oftentimes the day is having to do with like light, things that can be seen, and then night is going to have to do with um, the underworld journey and has to do with more unconscious processes and things not seeming so linear. One, two, three, four, five, six. Uh, freshman, sophomore, junior, senior, right? So that's more of daytime consciousness or nocturnal consciousness or uh, diurnal consciousness. But when people have night charts, oftentimes they have a tendency to be less ABC, one, two, three. Right. And it might be more intuitive and flowing. So this is just something to add to your practice um, or a consideration, really, to be quite honest. And so also I'm going to run through this like really quickly, not going to highlight this too much, but I have to put it in since we're talking about sect. And when it comes to sect, the sun is the ruler of the day. And here we see down here, the moon is the ruler of the night. And so with the day chart. There's going to be, well, I mean, it's a sect, right? So sect, let's say, instead of saying sect, let's call it a team. So you have a day team and you have a night team. And so if you're born during the day, 
Jupiter, Saturn, and the sun are more so on your team. And if you were born at night, then the moon, Mars, and Venus are more on your team. Or that's to say they're going to express themselves in a way that is more subjectively easeful or more subjectively positive in your experience. And you see here, wait, did I, no. And you see here, I didn't put Mercury because Mercury does whatever Mercury wants to do. Now, there is a way to calculate if you have a more sun or daytime type of Mercury or a nighttime type of Mercury, but I didn't want to go into those details. So, but I did want to add that in. So if this interests you, you can go explore that further. So aspect, aspect theory additions. So I'm going to make just a few little differentiations about how I see aspects from different astrological perspectives. Um, and so, yeah, I want to make it clear that it's how I see them and how I work with them more so than that's like, oh, this is definitely what the tradition says. Because like I said before, I'm kind of a heretic, so I kind of do what I want because I synthesize all these things. And also a lot of times the concepts that people bring up in astrology don't match my worldview and the way that I see reality working. So I have to synthesize, synthesize them. So here's a quote from Dava Green, and she's talking about aspects and from the perspective of evolution and astrology. Aspects occur within these phases that correlate with specific stages of development within human consciousness. So forgetting about the phases thing, but here with evolutionary astrology, we see that when we're looking at aspects, oftentimes or primarily what we're looking at is where is this person at in this evolutionary process from a psychological and consciousness perspective? Here, this is a quote from Chris Brennan's book, Hellenistic Astrology, even though the quote comes from Galen. A body that is seen does one of two things. Either it sends something from itself to us and thereby gives an indication of its particular character. Or if it does not itself send something, it waits for some sensory power to come to it from us. So here we're just talking about the relationship between planets and how planets will either be receiving energy from another planet or it's like they, they're, their feelers or their sensors are out there kind of feeling into it. So they still have some type of relationship even if they don't see them clearly. And so this is just talking about two bodies interfacing with each other, period, right? Which also goes into a bunch of other different things, um, the type of aspects that they do and don't use and how they use them. Um, but I'm not going to go into that today, just giving a little perspective. And then this um, last quote is from a medical astrologer named Elaine Nauman. And so she says, the sign, the sign the planet is in will indicate where illnesses occur and the house pla placement will suggest why ailments may develop. So we see this is way different, right? So it's like before we were talking about these like stages of specific um, human consciousness, human consciousness development. And the other one we're talking about, well, this planet sees that planet. And so they're going to interact in a certain way. Well, here we see is talking about the physiology specifically. And so my question is, how do you think about aspects? What have you learned about aspects from a modern perspective, from a traditional perspective, from an evolutionary perspective, from a horary astrology perspective, from a mundane astrology perspective, from a medical astrology perspective? And how can you begin to synthesize all those things at once if your mind works that way? If your mind doesn't work that way, then even what I'm saying right now might feel or sound a little actually incoherent to you. So it's also good to remember that some people have the synthesis brain and some people go down the straight and narrow of one tradition. And that's totally fine. You just need to know yourself so that you know what type of practice you need to have. So I'm going to talk about a few things with aspect theory again. And here we're going to talk about degree base versus sign based aspects. We'll talk about superior and inferior aspects. And then we'll talk about uh, an example from medical astrology and how all these things work. <clears throat> so degree base versus sign based aspects. Here we see we have Mercury and Jupiter in the sign of Aries. And Aries is in a square relationship with Cancer because Cancer is 
one, two, three signs away from it. So that makes a square relationship between those two signs inherently. Now in evolutionary astrology, we use degree-based um, aspects. So that would mean, mm, let's see here. Let me actually go to one that is degree-based. So let's talk about degree-based aspects really quickly. Given an example. So if we have if we have an aspect that's a degree based, we see that this Mercury is at 23 degrees and we see this moon is at 28 degrees. So oftentimes there's something called an orb, which is like the amount of distance that a planet can be from away from another one to consider an aspect. So 28 and 23 are pretty close together, let's say. So that means this is a degree based aspect. Right. But here, going back to this, we have a sign-based aspect. So we have Aries being in a square relationship with Cancer. And even though this 19 degrees Mercury is not right next to, or the number isn't close to the degree of four, we still have a sign-based aspect. And so to take a step back, we see here, when it comes to aspects, either it sends something from itself to us, thereby gives an indication of its particular character, right? And so when we're doing that, it's more of a degree-based aspect. But if it's not a degree-based aspect and it's a sign-based aspect, then this second part will be indicated. If it does not itself send something, it waits for some sensory power to come to it from us, right? So one is like, it's giving it straight to us, we can see it. And the other one is, I kind of feel it or something's going on here, energetically speaking. So it still applies as an aspect, but it isn't emphasized as much. And, and when I say it's not emphasized as much in some practices, it is emphasized. But the way I've synthesized it with evolutionary astrology, it's not as emphasized, but it still is in play. And if you're using evolutionary astrology aspects, then you'll be reading aspects no matter no matter if they're de degree based or sign based, they all will have meaning, right? <clears throat> so here's another example of a sign based aspect, right? We have the moon at 27 degrees, Aquarius in a square relationship with Taurus, and Mercury's at 14 degrees. And that's a little bit far out, but just because they're in a square relationship by sign, it still has some type of relevance. So that's something to look for in your practice. <clears throat> and then we also have something called a superior and inferior aspects. So again, we're using the same example of Mercury in the moon. And so the way to be able to tell if something is superior or inferior, well, I guess I gotta tell you what superior and inferior are, huh? <laughs> so a superior aspect is when one planet is has a more dominance over another one, or it has more say in the relational dynamic, let's say. Not in fear as the other planet is below it, but superior as in, I'm kind of the boss here, right? I'm kind of the boss here. So to understand or see when a planet is in a superior or inferior uh, aspect, what we do is we stand, we act as if we are the planet and we look into the chart, into the middle of the chart. And then we look to the right, and then we look to the left. And so let's use Mercury as an example here. If I'm Mercury, and I'm looking into the middle of the center of the chart, I look to the right and I see the moon. And since I'm looking to the right to see the moon, what that means is I'm in a superior position. And so really, it's just that simple. And so sometimes the way that this can modulate things in my practice with like infusing in evolutionary astrology is I can kind of see which planet is speaking a little louder there, right? Because we can look at the aspect and know, oh, it's Mercury moon. And Mercury moon has a specific flavor or combination of influence. But which planet has more say here, right? That can tell a lot of things. And so for the medical astrology example, 
and then we can even bring in the whole um, sign based versus degree based. So this, let's look at this square from Mars to Venus. The sign of Taurus is in a square with the sign of Leo. And then if we stand on, to, and that's, so that's degree based, I mean, that's sign based, but it also is degree based because nine degrees away, I would still give that an orb of influence, right? <clears throat> and then if we look at the perspective of superior versus inferior, we stand on top of Mars and then we look to the and see Venus. But then we look to the right and we see Venus. So Mars has a superior position over Venus here. And so that means Venus is, I mean, Mars is going to be having at it with Venus. Mars is kind of running the show here. And it just so happens that in this chart example, the person did have like some strong experiences of having like the fifth house being about I mean, it has a lot to do with a lot of different things, but here let's talk about the solar inner child or being able to be seen in the way they would try to assert themselves and be seen in relationships, Venus, right? It would seem like they would get a lot of anxiety and go into a fight or flight response more than they would make connections. So they began to start hiding things from people and not expressing themselves fully. And I mean, that like, it's like, what does that have to do with medical astrology? Nothing at all. But what it does have to do with medical astrology is this person also, in this feeling of not being able to express themselves, started having issues with their thyroid, right? So we're talking about the thyroid, we're talking about the throat, we're talking about Mars, we're talking about the adrenal glands kind of being a little too active there because they didn't, they didn't feel like they could shine their light and they didn't feel seen. And what this also did was create an issue with their circulatory system, which Leo rules the circulatory system, right? And it became weakened. It started getting like, they started having a, a relaxed tissue state in their circulatory system. So that's kind of how that works. I know that might be a bit much for people who don't know much about medical astrology, but I'm just giving a reflection on how these kind of things can show up. <clears throat> And then next we have triplicity lords. Hmm. Do I want to talk about triplicity lords? Let's see what I have next. Give me a second. Oh, we're not going to get to transfer the years. Okay, let's, let's talk about triplicity lords a little bit. Okay, so with triplicity lords, this is not an evolutionary astrology at all. So just bear with me if you haven't heard of this concept. But every single element, right? has three signs that correspond to it. So we have fire element, and the fire signs are Aries, Leo, and Sagittarius. And so these are always going to have what's called triplicity lords, or we can say the lords of the, the, lords of the elements. And so for the fire signs, the lords of the elements, or the triplicity lords, are the sun, Jupiter, and Saturn. If we go back and just think about what we were talking about before, this also is bringing back a little bit of the idea of the sect doctrine, right? Hmm. hmm. And then the same thing for all these other ones. Um, I'm not going to go into it too far, but for the air signs, Gemini, Libra, and Aquarius, we have Saturn, we have Mercury, and we have Jupiter. And I know before we talked about Mercury not necessarily having a sect inherently, but Mercury does whatever it wants to do. And so Mercury's here. And of course, Mercury likes the air. Hmm. Also have to talk about diurnal nocturnal. Okay. So if you have, and then you can see here we have diurnal, nocturnal, and participating. So when it comes to this, let's talk about just the fire signs so that we can make sure that we get this understood. When it comes to the fire signs, if you have a diurnal or a day chart, like we were talking before, then the sun is the primary ruler of the triplicity. So it comes first. If you have a nocturnal chart or a night chart and your sun is below the horizon, then Jupiter will end up being right here where the sun is. So this isn't necessarily the format that they always come in. So Jupiter could be first. 
or the sun could be first. If it's a day chart, the sun comes first. If it's a night chart, Jupiter comes first. If Jupiter comes first, then the sun comes second. And then what we have here, the participating triplicity Lord will always be the participating triplicity Lord for every single element. And so this can factor in when we look at, for, each, for every house, there's at least three topics of every house, right? So when we think about the sixth house, oftentimes people talk about hard work or not feeling good enough or illness. And it's like, does one planet really correspond to all these things? You can read it that way, and it still does work, to be quite honest. But for every single house, we have three topics minimum that we can talk about. So let's look at the first house. The first house is having, these are the triplicity lords of the houses. So what this does is it takes 12 houses and then it turns it into like 36 topics instead of just 12. So it expands our range and ability to give more significance to what's going on in a specific house. So let's say we have a night chart. And we're looking at the triplicity lords of the first house. So here we have primary, here we have secondary, and then we, here we have participating. Well, I was just talking about before, if we have a night chart, Jupiter will be considered primary. The sun will be considered secondary. And then Saturn and the fire signs will always be participating. So wherever you look in a chart for approximately the first 30 years of someone's life, the primary triplicity Lord will have reign over their youth. So if I have a night chart, I would look to Jupiter and see, okay, kind of what's going on or what's the flavor of what's happening from the time someone's born to they're approximately 30 years old. And then secondary, we look to the sun and so what is the sun doing and then that will be what's happening from approximately 30 years old to 60 years old and then we have saturn for the participating and that would be from 60 years old to 90 years old and so not saying don't look at the first house and read the first house how you usually read it but this just gives more this just gives additional information it can color things in where there are spaces potentially missing. And so adding that into my practice has been like super expansive because we can, even though this is a traditional technique and we can read it that way, we can also see pretty clearly from my perspective and my practice, when I look to these planets in the beginning of someone's life, it'll be more about what is their beliefs? Their beliefs will be, like reigning over them, or they'll have some strong significance, right? Because, and I say beliefs have to do with Jupiter. We're talking about a nocturnal chart, which is the primary, right? So in their youth, and youth here, we're saying from the time they're born to 30, Jupiter will have a strong significance. The second part of their life, or middle age, let's say, from 30 to 60, the sun, will have more reign over that experience. And then at the end, Saturn will have reign over it. And so just thinking about that from an evolutionary astrology perspective, where is this person's sun? Where is this person's Jupiter? And like, when will the promise of that sun and that Jupiter be more emphasized and how will it express itself? And maybe even sometimes we think of things in evolutionary astrology as working um, dynamically at all times in one's life, but sometimes it's nice to start to emphasize certain planets at certain times. So I kind of want to stop here and not go into the technique um, called the, the transfer of years um, or the turning of the years, um, annual perfections, and see if anyone has any questions or reflections. <clears throat> also, if you're new to this concept, open invitation to go check out these concepts from uh, someone who is teaching them full on and or 
I will be checking back in the comment section probably for the first two to three months. I already like have it set up in my phone to check back the first two to three months um, after I do this lecture. So if you have any questions, feel free to reach out and let me know. So I'll end the presentation there and just wanna say thank you to Sue and Robin for having me here with EA Zoom meetings and I look forward to coming back again soon. Thank you, Cameron. That was wonderful. Um, I have uh, some suggestions that perhaps we could give some links um, to um, more information about some of these techniques. And yeah. uh, so if you can send those to me, I can add them to the description of the uh, in the video. Absolutely. We'll do that. Yeah. Great idea. I appreciate that. Awesome. Yeah. Yeah. So I see no questions and um, I thank you very much. Yeah, yes, thank, thank you. you, it was very well organized. Thank you, I appreciate that. Cool. cool. See Thanks you next time. I'll talk to you again soon, peace. Thank you, bye.